Hello and welcome to the Weekly Defence Podcast, the show about defence procurement and military technology, brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Viaset. I'm your host, Richard Thomas, Senior Editor Naval, and in this episode, we discuss a demonstration programme that could result in the British Army running on hybrid drive with its Foxhound and Jackal vehicles, while Turkey continues its push to develop indigenous defence capabilities with a new anti-ship missile destined for the Turkish Navy. In an interview with Defence Insight's senior land analyst, we explore the current state of Eastern Europe's armoured vehicle market, detailing key programmes and some of the likely influences behind them. And in our regular monthly roundup, our Asia-Pacific editor highlights the most significant recent stories from the region. But first, let's take a look at some of the headlines from this week. And we start in Sweden, where Saab is planning to offer its new lightweight air launch decoy missile as part of its Gripen EF proposal for Finland's HX fighter programme. Saab has given away few details about the decoy missile, but the company says it is designed to jam or create false targets for acquisition, tracking, fire control and airborne radars. The payload on the new decoy missile is to a large extent developed in Finland, particularly at the Saab Technology Centre in Tampere. In Russia, there weren't too many eye-catching land systems on display last week at the Army 2020 show in Moscow, but one notable new addition was the BMP-3M Manol infantry fighting vehicle. Manol has much in common with its predecessor, the BMP-3M Dragoon, which was unveiled five years ago. However, according to the manufacturer, manufacturer Kurgan Mashzavod, significant enhancements in Manol include a more ergonomic troop compartment plus increased protection and firepower. If adopted, Manol may be the best possible interim solution for the Russian ground forces until the Kurganets 25 enters service. On the other hand, there is no reason to believe that the Russian MOD would purchase the Manol anytime soon. In other land domain news, a local industry team led by General Dynamics European Land System Santa Barbara Sistemas is to manufacture the initial tranche of Dragon 8x8 wheeled combat vehicles for the Spanish Army under a 1.74 billion euro contract from the Spanish MOD. Dragon is based on the 8x8 Piranha 5 vehicle, but it will include Spanish national technologies as required by the MOD. Spanish government policy dictates that national companies must have at least a 70% work share in the programme. The first 348 vehicles will be delivered over seven years, although the Spanish requirement could grow to over to over 1,000 vehicles into further production batches. And finally, after a bumpy decade or so of development, the US Army is claiming progress on the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System after successful live-fire tests in late August. IBCS successfully downed targets in limited user tests held over the second half of August at the White Sands Missile Range. This indicates that the US Army and Prime Contractor Northrop Grumman appear to have straightened out problems that thwarted a similar assessment in 2016. US Army leaders now hope the $7.7 billion IBCS program will be ready to pivot to production before the end of 2020. Ultimately, the Army plans to incorporate the lower tier air and missile defense sensor into IBCS. Let's turn now to the Shepherd News Desk for the weekly in-depth analysis of uh, into key stories the journalists have been working up. And that means welcoming news editor Ben Vogel and land reporter Flavio Camargos Pereira. Hello to you both. Hi. Hello. Flavia, to you first, and the news on the potential development of hybrid drive for the British Army. Yes, Richard. A $4 million contract was awarded last month by the Ministry of Defence to a group of companies. They will demonstrate hybrid electric drive systems on the Fox Round and Jackal vehicles. This contract is part of the Protected Mobility Engineering and Technical Support Program. And the systems the system will be developed by NP, NP Aerospace and Air BSL. That's a, a UK-centric joint venture between Rymetal and BA system. It will be installed on Fox Round and Jaco prototypes. Uh, converted by General Dynamic Land Systems UK, Supercat, uh, Magitech, Millbrook, and the STL. Trials are likely to be completed in July next year. Yeah, I mean, hybrid uh, power systems and electric, it's, it's been par for the course for the commercial sector for a number of years now. So it makes sense that the British Army would you know, finally figure out it might be an idea to follow suit. What sort of uh, operational benefits do you foresee for hybrid drive for the British Army vehicles? Yeah, 
the first one we can point out is the fact that to improve the silent mobility of the fleet, it means that we will reduce the noise and increase the self capability. Also, it will provide sustainability benefits because it will reduce the, the fossil fuel consumption. Uh, Supercat will carry out the conversion of the Jacal, which is the UK variant of the company's HMT400. This process is being carried out in a way uh, that... Uh, will enable future enhancements in this platform. And uh, this, this will be quite useful as battery capacity and power management technology evolves. Uh, according to the company, the operation advantages of using this technology, um, it, it includes the ability to drive for a period on electrical power alone which is quite interesting um, to, to provide uh, platforms with these capabilities. Uh, General Dynamic Land Systems UK will demonstrate the hybrid technology on the Fox Round, Foxhound. Uh, I think I'll say this one again because it's, it wasn't good. General Dynamic Land Systems UK will demonstrate the hybrid technology on the Foxhound uh, for the company, the platform will deliver silent mobility, enhanced silent watch capabilities, off-board electrical powers, and increased on-board power as well. So besides the tests or potential tests and developments of hybrid technology, what, what sort of other areas is the British Army looking to invest in, in sort of disruptive technology or things like that? Yeah, these, these vehicle tests are part... Um, uh, of an army effort to enhance the investments in disruptive technology. I mean, besides the hybrid technology, the British Army intends to explore the potential of robotic platoon vehicles, autonomous air and ground systems, digital equipment for dismounted soldier, and remote-controlled armored vehicles. Uh, uh, these capabilities will initially be used for in-serve experimentation, but um, the goal is to allow the army to, to benefit from what's available now while the service is refining the requirements for future acquisitions. Sure. Thanks, Savia. Thanks for the update. Uh, ben, over to you and the development of the Atmaja anti-ship missile. Thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, an interesting piece from our Istanbul correspondent, Cem Devrim Yaylala. Uh, about uh, recent milestones in development of, of Admaja. Um, he reports that the latest test firing of Admaja Block 1 uh, occurred very recently at a range on the Black Sea coast. Um, now, this missile, which resembles type um, harpoon, um, flew its uh, full range of 220 kilometres, apparently for the first time. Now, uh, Admaja was first test fired in 2016 at Sinop, and twice more in 2019, including live firing in November from an Arda class Corvette. Um, and videos uh, from the most recent test firing uh, appear to show a sea skimming capability has been developed. Yeah, it's interesting. There, there are schools of thought when it comes to anti ship missiles as to whether you go uh, low and fast or whether you want to use maneuverability to avoid any, any sort of countermeasures by, by, by uh, naval ships. How many, how many of these missiles does, does Turkey need? And for which ships will, will, will the system be uh, fitted to? Well, it seems that uh, Rocketsan, which is the manufacturer of Admaja, uh, is scheduled to make between 64 and 100 of those missiles in the initial production run. Um, and uh, in terms of the ships, uh, Admaja is earmarked to arm all four of the Arda class corvettes um, for the Turkish Navy. But the Navy has also earmarked a vessel in a different class, uh, a vessel called a, a TCG Istanbul, uh, as the first ship to be e equipped with the Block 1 missiles. And Istanbul will have 16 of them in four quad launchers, which um, is apparently a unique configuration for the Turkish Navy. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a lot of potential firepower there. Uh, when's Atmaka expected to enter service then? Um, it's expected to enter full service with the Turkish Navy 
in the second half of 2020. Although, of course, with the COVID pandemic uh, bubbling away, um, that has been delayed. But uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, Admaja Block 2 is already under development. So uh, this is a sign of the clear ambition that the Turkish industry and uh, Rocketsan has. Um, and the main difference between uh, Block 2 and Block 1 is that uh, the former um, includes a, a medium wave IR seeker. And this is designed to improve target accuracy and further reduce any susceptibility to countermeasures. Yeah, it sounds like a fairly well uh, developed and advanced system. Well, what does what does the development of Atmagis say about Turkey's uh, naval missile strategy? Um, well, the uh, Turkish uh, naval forces have spent years and years experimenting with tactics and techniques for deploying Harpoon. But now it seems that Turkey has defined its own set of requirements based on its own doctrine. And such thinking is, is shaped by the threat environment in the Black Sea, in the Aegean, and of course in the Mediterranean, where there are tensions at the moment, as, as uh, many people will know, uh, between Turkey and its neighbours, particularly Greece, uh, over energy exploitation rights. Um, and then, by the way, Richard, it's worth adding that um, there was talk of another live firing of Admaja um, just this past weekend, 30th, 31st of August, uh, using a decommissioned Turkish Navy ship as a target. But that doesn't seem to have happened. But all the same, the fact that uh, uh, Admaja development is very well advanced, it just shows that... Uh, the direction of travel for the Turkish uh, Navy with anti-ship missiles is quite well advanced. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you use the phrase threat environment and we're talking about, you know, uh, a country that, that sort of uh, borders, well, is, is, is both Europe but also near nearer east as well. So the idea that we should talk about a threat environment in a region um, uh, so close to home is, I guess it's, what is it? It's indicative sadly, of the uh, situation that we find ourselves in with the, the tensions in and around the Mediterranean. You've obviously got Turkey supporting uh, one side of what's going on in uh, Libya as well. Um, interesting, interesting times as always. OK, that's all from the newsroom for now. My thanks to Ben and Flavia. For our listeners, if you'd like to find out more about the stories discussed in this episode, please visit our website. Coming up next, I speak with Sonny Butterworth, Defence Insights Senior Land Analyst, uh, about Eastern Europe's armoured vehicle programmes, the drives and influences, and as ever these days, what impact the pandemic might have on procurements. My name is Tom Jesse. I'm the Director of Army Initiatives for Viaset. So what I get excited about is, you know, I just recently retired, so I still have a lot of friends uh, and comrades that are out in, in the thick of it. And so, and I also have a son who just joined the Army, and he's on his uh, way to becoming an Airborne Ranger. So I want my fellow uh, soldiers and airmen to have the best technology that they can to, be, to do well on the battlefield. And Viaset provides that. And so it keeps me involved with Army aviation. I get to go to the units. And, uh, and it just helps me uh, find out what it is they need and bring that back to Viasat. And then we develop those technologies to, uh, to help them out. That, that, to me, that's just very exciting. It's time for our regular catch-up now with Asia-Pacific editor Gordon Arthur to hear more about the big stories from the region. Hi, Gordon. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi there, Ben. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, let's uh, kick things off with the recent news that uh, India is banning imports of various types of defence equipment. Uh, what's the background to all of this? So India uh, last year was the, the world's third largest importer of defence equipment. And it's always been amongst the, the top few uh, in the world in terms of importing uh, material. And so India has been trying for a long time, for decades in fact, to reverse this um, to become a defence exporter, a net exporter, rather than a, an importer. So it's encouraging uh, more indigenization, more domestic production. So to sort of improve its chances of succeeding in this, uh, it introduced on the 9th of August what it calls the negative import list. And essentially... Uh, you know about you have the 101 Dalmatians. Well, India has 101 deletions. It's it's preventing 
uh, 101 different products from being imported. They all have to be bought uh, indigenously. So that's that's what's been going on. Now, interestingly, probably about a third of the items on the list are already things that it's buying from home anyway. So I don't see a, a, a wholesale um, change of tack here anyway. Um, so uh, needless to say, Gordon, I'm not going to ask you to name all 101 of these uh, uh, categories, these, these items, but um, what, what leaps out at you from, from the list? Well, to be honest, Ben, nothing really leaps out at me. Um, I mean, if, if we just generalise, um, things to be banned, we've got aircraft, uh, which specifically would relate to the, the Tejas light fighter, uh, we have AFE, so India's or Tata Motors in particular has been developing an 8x8 armoured vehicle. Ammunition, artillery pieces, so the M777 is already being built um, in India along with uh, other pieces. Uh, radars, simulators, small arms, sonars, those are the kind of things that it wants to build within India. Now, I have to mention that this is sort of be a, a graduated uh, programme, so the first item, 69 of them, will be implemented this coming December. And then next year, uh, some more items. And then a, a third phase will be the, the final items. So whether it will work or not, I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a saga in India, of course. So by stipulating that the armed forces must buy from indigenous companies, does that mean that the armed forces are going to be getting the best available equipment. That's the question that I have. And uh, no doubt there'll be uh, a number of uh, uh, political uh, decisions to be made on that score. Um, staying in India, Gordon, uh, you, you've written about uh, the uh, MOD, the Armed Forces, possibly procuring a new light tank. Yeah, now this is something that's been sort of bouncing around in India for a, for a long time, the idea of procuring a, a light tank. And the last time they did think about it, they actually decided they would keep, they would stick with the, the T-72 um, and use that. But things have changed. So you, no doubt you're aware there was some, some bloody fisticuffs uh, on the line of actual control with China several months ago. China also, the PLA, they have the Type 15 light tank. And India is quite concerned that it's been um, outmatched. Of course, this area along the border, um, it's high altitude, it's mountainous, and a, a regular main battle tank's not really suitable for, for those kind of environments. So India's looking at acquiring a lighter tank that could be useful in these kind of environments. It was actually the last time they considered this was 2009. They got as far as issuing a, a request for information. Uh, but as with many things in India, it all sort of fizzled out in the end. So uh, there's very much a sense of deja vu uh, about this uh, potential uh, light tank yeah, development. I, yeah, and I think that their choices are limited too. Um, people have been talking about um, a couple, one or two Russian offerings. Uh, you have Indonesian, Indonesian slash Turkish option. You've got uh, South Korea. And that, that's really about it. There's, there's not an awful lot to choose from. And bearing in mind what uh, we spoke about first of all, uh, um, is there any indication that light tanks were included in the 101 categories, thereby ruling out a, a foreign source? No, no light tanks in there. And in fact, while you mentioned that, uh, we, we can quickly uh, say that India has two programs underway. One is for a, a new IFE, the other is for a new main battle tank. These have been going on for, for months and years uh, with very little progress uh, to show for it. So they're looking for indigenous um, products. But again, yeah, who, who knows whether they'll actually end up with something suitable and timely. Yes, I mean, I was going to ask you to get your crystal, crystal ball out, uh, Gordon, and, and uh, see uh, if you think India will be, will be able to see this project through this time, given, given the Chinese uh, incident that you mentioned. Yeah, well, I think this this conflict with China has opened India's eyes and then suddenly um, all these tangles of bureaucracy and red tape that have, have hindered the armed forces for so long, uh, perhaps that will clear uh, some of those out of the way so that it can get what it needs much more quickly. 
Um, moving on from India now, Gordon, uh, you've reported on naval procurement in Indonesia. So uh, how is that evolving? Yeah, in Indonesia, we, we have mentioned this on the previous podcast. So there was a bit of a, a kerfuffle over uh, Indonesia's interest in typhoon fighters from Austria. Um, there was also interest expressed in the, the Osprey, uh, which I personally I think is beyond the reach probably of the, the Indonesian defence budget. But nevertheless, the Indonesian Navy also, it's, it, there's pluses and minuses, there's steps forward, there's steps back. So at latest count, it's, it's quite possible um, that Indonesia will reconsider its purchase of three submarines from South Korea. So this deal was signed April last year with uh, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering. And progressively, for those three uh, submarines, more of them was going to be built um, in Indonesia by PT Pal. So whether that will go ahead because of the the credit crunch brought about by COVID-19, it's it's difficult to know. But apart from submarines, uh, Indonesia's also expressed interest in frigates. And we mentioned India's sort of defining moment with uh, China uh, along the border. Uh, I think Indonesia had a a similar epiphany earlier this year in January when uh, Chinese fishing boats escorted by China Coast Guard vessels intruded into the Indonesian uh, exclusive economic zone. And this really disturbed the Indonesians. So I think they would like some some larger warships uh, that can sort of help counter uh, these kind of intrusions. So Indonesia has been connected to a possible purchase of a, a, a couple of frigates from uh, Denmark, from a company called Odense Maritime Technology, OMT. So nothing has been signed apart from sort of a, a cooperation preamble. There is no um, production contract yet, but that's certainly one possibility. And these would be the largest warships that Indonesia has uh, potentially. So there's a, a, a balance to be struck, I suppose, between uh, a realistic affordability given the uh, possible and potential effects of COVID on the Indonesian economy and the, the need for some kind of urgent operational requirement to, to counter China. Exactly. And, and yeah, you, you're very right in using the word affordability as well. E- even more recently, um, Apparently, the, the Navy or the MOD was directed to, to look into the purchase of a, a German frigate, um, a second-hand one that's going to be decommissioned. So this may be a way of Indonesia saving money and, and getting uh, new warships into the, the Navy faster. I, I think the Indonesian Navy does have a bit of a... Yeah, its, it's track record is not particularly good. So just looking at a few facts and figures, in the past eight years, seven warships have been lost um, either sunk or caught fire. So, I mean, that's 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 pretty high attrition rate, isn't it? Um, moving on to uh, South Korea now, um, the MOD has released a massive spending blueprint. So um, what are the salient features of that one, Gordon? Yeah, I mean, South Korea is, is a bit of a powerhouse in, in terms of military expenditure and also in terms of defence exports. Um, so you're beginning to see South Korean equipment all over the world, basically. And every five, uh, or every, the the Ministry of National Defence, they release a, a five year plan um, each each year, um, sort of updating it as as it rolls over. So on tenth of August, they released their plan for the, the coming five years. Uh, it was worth two hundred and fifty three billion dollars, and that represents an average annual increase of six point one percent, which is pretty sizable. Um, at the end of that five years, its budget would be approximately 41, or it would rise from 41 billion to 56 billion dollars. And you're probably interested to know what it's going to spend it on. Indeed, what are the uh, salient features? Well, I, I think for the the navy, probably the most interesting, and uh, if you're a, a South Korean, probably the most exciting one is a program called the LPX2. So this is a follow-on from the Docto class, which are LHDs. And the LPX-2 is basically a light aircraft carrier. It would be a flagship for a maritime task force. 
Um, and the significant thing is it would um, accommodate F-35B uh, fighters on its, its flight deck. Uh, apparently, it wouldn't have a well deck, so it's not going to be used for amphibious assault um, as an LHD would. Um, but, yeah, it, it'll be a, a fairly large vessel, empty displacement. They're talking about 30,000 tonnes and the F-35Bs to go with it. So that, that's pretty significant. And I was just going to move on to the Air Force. So I think prominent there, you've got the KFX fighter, which is a 4.5 generation fighter jet. So that's still uh, in being developed. We have satellites. So South Korea is looking to, to launch more satellites, especially smaller ones, uh, into orbit. So this will help with its ISR. Certainly ballistic missile defense and uh, ballistic missiles, those are, are things, or, and, and long-range surface-to-air missiles, those are being developed and will enter service. And there's one more um, that I think we can look at in more detail, and that's the whole idea of a, a stealthy, unarmed combat air vehicle. Yes, sir. Do go on. I've been to the, the Seoul air show for, for a number of years. And each time, uh, the two main UAV makers, the, the two largest ones, which are Korea Aerospace Industries and Korean Air, they always show these models of these stealthy-looking um, UCAVs. So it, it appears um, that one of them is in development, and it's called the, the Kauri X, which apparently means the Stingray X. And this is in development for the Republic of Korea Air Force. And we're, we're hearing that this stealthy uh, UAV should be fully developed by 2025. Now, I can't tell you which company is involved with this, whether it's KAI or Korean Air, I'm, I'm not sure. But certainly that's very interesting um, and very mysterious. And we, we don't exactly know what it looks like. Uh, but certainly it will be an armed UAV. Indeed, uh, an intriguing development. And uh, from what you've been saying, Gordon, South Korea does seem to be very keen to invest in an incredibly broad range of military capabilities. Um, clearly, they're not particularly as concerned by the economic impact of COVID on, the, on their national defence budget as uh, some of uh, the other countries in the region. Yeah, well, I think South Korea is always concerned about its belligerent neighbour to the north, also China Indeed. more so. So it, it probably cannot afford to um, decrease its spending. Uh, but certainly in terms of yeah, domestic capability, uh, R&D uh, production, uh, South Korea has is, is, is really made significant leaps. And uh, one final question on, on, on South Korea, um, given what you've been saying, Gordon. Um, are there any moves for uh, that country to develop some kind of loyal wingman uh, UAV-related uh, um, capability? That's a very good question, and I don't have an answer off the top of my head. <laughs> all, all I can say is I, I have not heard um, of anything. Um, certainly, it's, it's sort of the flavour of the day, isn't it? The Australians are looking at it, for example. Um, but South Korea, mm. I, I haven't heard anything. But certainly, unmanned technology is something that they really are pursuing. So un unmanned ground vehicles, uh, unmanned underwater vehicles and UAVs. And perhaps just on that note, I can mention that um, Korean Air um, has developed a, a medium altitude, long endurance UAV, and that should be ready to be deployed by the Air Force in the first half of next year. Um, so that, that will be ISR, and probably it will also be an armed um, aircraft as well. Gordon Arthur, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Great to talk to you. It's a fairly obvious point, but military equipment is getting increasingly sophisticated and therefore the requirement to effectively train people not just to use it, but also to fight with that military equipment is becoming increasingly complex and demanding. The biggest challenge that we have is not only designing and delivering training now for Generation Y, is planning for Generation Z, but the capabilities that we're developing now, when you look at the new Challenger tank or the new Warrior, but think of Type 31 ships, the new Dreadnought submarine, 
All of those, we need to start thinking about Generation Alpha. The way we work is changing at a tremendous pace. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed the need to upskill employees whose roles were already being disrupted by the rapid evolution of emerging technologies. Welcome to the Defining the Future podcast, Shepherd Studios series on aerospace and defence innovation, sponsored by our partner Raytheon UK, a company invested in Britain, creating British jobs and supporting local communities around the United Kingdom. Over the course of four episodes, we will tell the story of how innovation fostered by industry is helping the UK step out of the shadow of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear how emerging technologies are supporting the prosperity agenda developed by the government to accelerate Britain's growth in these uncertain times. And we will hear from representatives across industry about how transformation and cutting-edge technologies designed for the military are beginning to reshape the commercial sector. To learn more about how defence innovation is transforming the training sphere, listen to the Defining the Future podcast, available now wherever you get your podcasts. Although facing difficulties in modernising its military, Russia has proved with Abkhazia, Georgia and Ukraine that it remains a first-rate land power, able to influence, threaten and enact large-scale state or hybrid assaults against countries on its periphery. Eastern Europe, then, should be a good market for armoured vehicle programmes as countries look to secure their own borders against external threats, such as Russia, in a geographical part of the world where armoured warfare is very much a relevant doctrine. Joining me on the Weekly Defence podcast to examine the armoured vehicle market in Eastern Europe is Defence Insight Senior Analyst Land, Sonny Butterworth. Sonny, hello again. Hi, Richard. So give us an idea, a taste of what the the market for armoured vehicles in Eastern Europe will look like over the next five or ten years or so. So based on our forecasts and looking at um, the market for new production armoured vehicles, we're expecting to see the market peak in the middle of the 2020s, um, around so far um, $3 billion. Uh, That's based on the programmes that we've identified. And in particular, a lot of this growth will be focused in the track IFE and main battle tank sectors, which we're expecting to see um, quite a substantial expansion over those years. And that's as um, several programmes in countries across the region um, reach that stage where they're either um, entering production or, or, or transitioning into full rate production too. Um, also, we expect to see quite a um, large number of funds invest into 8x8s, eight eight, um, though there's probably fewer opportunities here because um, many of those programmes have already selected their um, preferred platform, if you like, the, the contracts are in place, but that's again then um, entering that production stage or, or remaining in production. Um, also, the market for 4x4s four is expected to, or lighter armoured vehicles is expected mm. to um, account for a sort of steady share of the market across that period. And many of the countries in this region perhaps don't have um, the large fleets that we had in Western Europe um, that were procured uh, during Afghanistan and Iraq um, for counterinsurgency. But um, even with that being less of a focus now, um, protected mobility, I think, is one of the legacies of that that's um, really been um, or has really been emphasised as having an important capability to have. So I think countries will look to invest in those vehicles as well. I mean, we see that even with Russia, um, where it's trying to um, provide new armoured vehicles for its um, VDV, the airborne forces, to enable it to deploy much more rapidly, um, enable those kind of expeditionary operations that we've seen the West move to as well. So, um, yeah, there's lots of activity in the market, but the, the tracked and main battle tank sectors, I think, are the ones to watch in particular. What's... What's driving the growth? I mean, I mentioned Russia, but are, are, there, are there other factors that's uh, behind this uh, demand? So I think Russia is definitely the, the main one to look for. And we see countries in this region have some of the, the fastest um, growing defence budgets in, in Europe too. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, land warfare is um, very much in, in focus as well. So many of those funds are being invested into either procuring new capabilities or um, upgrading or replacing old ones. And I think when we look at armoured vehicles in particular, and I mentioned the, the heavy sector or the tracked sector being a um, main focus, I think, I think, for the next decade. Many of the vehicles already in operation are, first of all, very old, um, mm. in the sense you know, they were procured and made during the Cold War. And of course, a, a corollary of that is that they're also um, either Soviet platforms or 
um, licensed produced derivatives of Soviet platforms or based on that same technology. And I think many of the countries in the region would like to actually um, standardize on NATO um, standard equipment for um, you know, interoperability um, more commonality with their allies. So we are seeing several programs in countries in the region to um, procure new NATO sand equipment. So Hungary is a good example with the Junyi uh, 2026 program. So again, I think that was started in early t- um, 2017. And you know, by 2026, they want to have many programs in place to really phase out all of that Soviet equipment, which is suffering from very poor readiness as it is as well. So they're, they're kind of struggling to have those capabilities when they need them. Um, and again, the Czech Republic as well wants to procure new um, equipment to out- outfit its um, mechanized brigade that will be deployed with, with NATO as well. So there's, um, I think Russia, yeah, is what we should have in the, in the forefront of our minds. And then that's had a knock-on effect on why um, countries need to modernize their armored vehicles. It's almost as though you preempted one of my next questions, actually. So where, where are these countries looking to get the armored uh, vehicles from? What, what, what sort of, um, uh, what sort of uh, preferences do they have? I mean, you mentioned NATO, so I guess they're looking westwards, aren't they? Yeah, so predominantly, yeah, at the moment they're looking westwards. But um, one thing to emphasize is that they want really to um, build up their own defense industries as well. So they're particularly after deals where they can get transfer of technology or some form of local assembly or production. So, I mean, a good example that's been in the news recently is um, Hungary signed an agreement to with Rheinmetall to set up a facility, hopefully, to produce the, the um, Lynx KF-41 mm. in, in Hungary. And you know, when you look at the press release, um, one of the things that's emphasized is the effect that that will have on revitalizing the Hungarian defense industry. But yeah, mainly mainly from the West, particularly, I think, in Europe. Um, again, looking at the, the Czech Republic's IFE tender at the moment, um, the competitors are really from, from Europe. So you've got BA Systems, uh, General Dynamics, um, etc. cetera. So yeah, it's, it's Europe where they're predominantly looking. But having said that as well, um, first of all, there are some countries in the region that have their own um, defence industry that's actually quite well established and is able to provide some of their needs. So Ukraine would be an example of this um, that has suffered from quite a few problems, I think, with quality control. Um, recently, they took delivery of some BTR4s from uh, Ukraborenprom, one of their um, subsidiary companies. And that contract has originally been signed in 2016, um, but has only recently been fulfilled. So it gives you an idea of some of the problems there. Mm. Um, but Belarus is another one that has a its own industry that's capable of upgrading or providing some platforms and it looks looks to Russia for some of its other ones. Um, And then Serbia as well, which has its own industry but can also look elsewhere. I mean, including even China um, recently with some air defense and UAVs. So um, there is a scope to look elsewhere. Um, I mentioned Hungary as well earlier and uh, it looks like they will be um, adopting armored vehicles from Turkey, some four by fours. as part of that, that big modernization program. And then another um, one to consider is, is the US. So we have seen several um, foreign military sales for the JLTV concluded mm. quite recently. And it looks like we'll probably see some more as well. Um, countries like North Macedonia, which are now starting to build up their NATO armies, they look to protect the mobility first of all as a, a place to start. And JLTV is a good way to get that because it's already in production for the US so you can benefit from all those cost savings. Um, and then the US is actually running some programs um, to help wean uh, their allies off this Soviet equipment. So the European um, Recapitalization Incentive Program, ERIP, is a good example of that. And it's mainly targeting countries in the, the Balkans and some Baltic countries as well. Um, and yeah, JLTV looks like it might benefit from that. We saw late last year, I think, um, Croatia sign a contract to procure secondhand Bradley. So after Lebanon and the US, it will be one of the uh, you know only countries operating that platform at the moment, but probably see more as more are available for surplus. So there is um that could sort of upset the market somehow because it might take away market share from some of the, the local manufacturers that can also offer four by four vehicles, which are you know easier, have a sort of lower threshold to produce. Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's a, a really good point to make. Um, do, do you think? I mean. It's a, it's a little bit of a hypothetical, but do you think that there's a risk that um, looking towards NATO, looking towards FMSs in the US uh, secondhand market, do you think that that might create, or even a first-hand market with the JLTV, do you think that might create a dependency on um, procuring platforms from outside by countries in Eastern Europe 
to the detriment of their of, of its uh, internal indigenous uh, manufacturing capabilities. I suppose there is that 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 problem. Um, but as I mentioned, when we look at many of the countries um, that already have like quite a well established um, defence industry, they are looking to for that for that to benefit from these deals as well. Um, so it's really just a case of will these industries be sustainable once you know they've delivered the initial initial platform? Will they be able to continue? Um, to deliver or secure contracts in the region. Yeah. And perhaps if some of the other countries that don't have that industry that could perhaps be customers end up going to the US, then they might lose out on that regional market, which can be a good way to secure those initial sales to then help other export customers or encourage those to adopt those platforms. So yeah. definitely something they, I think they need to consider. So uh, given this is the era of the pandemic, what will the pandemic do to threaten the projections and the procurement of armoured vehicles in Eastern Europe? I think it certainly could have an effect um, and a negative one too. We haven't um, really seen that at the moment so much, but of course it's still the early days as as far as the economy is concerned. I mean, towards the beginning, there was news about the Czech Republic some tender to procure 210 new infantry fighting vehicles. There was news that that could be... um, cancelled or delayed in some way because in the middle of a pandemic it wasn't considered a pressing priority but it's since been basically ring fenced and they've said that we'll we'll go ahead as planned i mean the the hungarian announcement i mentioned as well that was quite a surprise because it's um a, you know worth probably going to be worth more than 2 billion euros so it's a it's a big ticket deal um from a country that still seems to be focused on defense i think it will really come down to um how are these countries as gdps affected in the future and then what effect does that have on defence spend? Will they be able to keep up that growth? Because if they can't, then I think we're going to see um, then they might have to somewhat scale back their ambitions. And that could be cancellations or it could be um, like the Czech Republic has said it's, it will do. It will spread out the, yeah. the cost of the procurement over several more years and the delivery schedule as well. Um, but it's also, I think, important to know that in the region generally there are always troubles with procuring armoured vehicles, particularly expensive ones that involve um, lots of complex negotiations. So um, a lots, of ish- a lots of instances where tenders have been cancelled because they've had to be investigated for some sort of corruption or irregularities, and also then disagreements between governments and OEMs. So Ryan Mattel also had a, a deal with the Romanian government to produce the Agilis 8x8 armoured vehicle, and that's really been stuck in, in limbo now for quite some time due to disagreements with cost and the Romanian government, I think, wanted to change its procurement. So there's, there's always those risks. And I think COVID could really amplify that if it makes the, the funds that they're dependent on to realise them not available. While we're talking about cost, just just, just finally, um, is it getting harder for Eastern European countries to replace fleets on a, a like-for-like basis, um, as seen in you know, the sea and the air domains? So I, I guess in a a nutshell, is the land domain suffering the same kind of platform price inflation as the other domains are seeing? I think there is, yeah, definitely some some inflation, but the problem isn't as pronounced as, say, if we looked at Western Europe, where um, they really had to scale back the size of their fleets. Um, They tend to still be procuring quite large numbers of vehicles, especially for the size, and actually in some sense, there's new capabilities that haven't even operated before. So there's almost a, <laughs> not, not really like a kind of 100% increase as such, and if mm. you look at it from that way. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, as long as that defence spending can remain high, then their, their ambitions will too. But that said, um, they, certain countries in particular, um, so, so Poland is a good example of this, do operate very large numbers of legacy platforms. And while, say, for example, with their new infantry fighting vehicle, the Borsuk, they have outlined plans to procure around 1,600, including specialised variants. It does really remain to be seen in the current kind of climate, whether that, that is actually sustainable and they can realise that or whether it will take several years to, to get to that level. Um, and so I think we've seen a lot of activity in the upgrade market and we'll continue to do so as well. I mean, Russia is one of the good examples of that really at the extreme end, where if you look at its tanks, they do have the Armata mm. program on going, which is making some progress and, and should hopefully for them enter production soon. But they will still continue to rely on large numbers of upgraded tanks. Um, at the Army 2020 exhibition just last week, they signed another contract to upgrade T-34 
T80B tanks, the BVM standard for their, their units operating in cold weather. Um, so again, I think we'll see much more activity as well in the, the upgrade to try and keep those fleets at the same number. Um, but yeah, it doesn't seem to have had such an effect as it has in Western Europe, that price inflation, even though it's, it's definitely there, they're much more now expensive to, to procure and maintain, especially with um, countries wanting to uh, help their domestic industry. That always adds on to the cost of establishing new supply chains. Um, et cetera, so. Indeed. I mean, it's, you've, you've outlined a, a huge potential market that Eastern Europe is and has. But as ever with these with these conversations that we have, there's a, a dark cloud as ever with the COVID-19 pandemic, which might impact uh, procurement and delivery in the in the future. Sonny Butterworth, Senior Analyst Land, many thanks for coming on. Much appreciated. Thanks very much, Richard. This episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast was brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Viasat. As always, a very big thank you to everybody who took the time to participate in this week's episode. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed today's show, please make sure that you like and subscribe or leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also start a conversation or give us feedback by joining the Global Defence Community Group on LinkedIn. This is a platform to interact with our team of journalists and analysts, and you can also discuss breaking news as it happens. Head on over to shepherdmedia.com slash global defence community or search global defence community on LinkedIn to join. Until next week, thank you for listening.